Hello everyone, my name is Frances Brill and I'm from NFER's Centre for Assessment. I'd like to welcome you all very warmly to the NFER today. Thanks so much for joining us for this Bite into Writing webinar. So the theme of the webinar today is teaching and assessing Year 6 writing in 2021. And for this, I'm really pleased to say that we're joined by Margaret Fennell and Joe Shackleton. Margaret and Jo are the authors of Bite Into Writing, which is NFER's new writing resource for Year 6. They're going to be discussing some of the challenges of teaching and assessing writing and explaining how the approach of Bite Into Writing can help address those challenges. As I've been working really closely with Margaret and Jo as they've been developing the materials, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the authors themselves. Ashley, can we have the first slide, please? Thank you. So Margaret and Jo have worked together now for almost 10 years. And as I'm sure you can see from this slide, they've got a wealth of literacy experience to share. This includes working on behalf of the Standards and Testing Agency on the national curriculum tests and on teacher assessment, where they help to develop the exemplification materials, as well as the training and standardization materials for local authority moderators. Above all, they are passionate about pupils' writing and supporting the development of young writers, which led them to the creation of the Bite Into Writing materials. So now I'm going to hand over to Margaret and Jo, who are going to tell you more about their approach to teaching and assessing Year 6 writing. Thank you, Francis. And just to say, we really do value this collaboration with NFER and we hope everyone listening in today will find it a useful and an informative session. So we thought we'd begin by considering some of the challenges associated with Year 6. And as we know, this can be a particularly challenging as well as a rewarding year for Year 6 teachers as pupils move into their final year of primary education. As they look ahead to moving schools, pupils often begin to feel they've outgrown their primary years. They begin to engage more with the world around them, to question and to respond to events and decisions that might impact on their own future. Often, they require even greater motivation and inspiration to help unlock their full potential. We all know that time is pressurised, both, both in terms of day-to-day -day planning for lessons and activities and ensuring everything fits into what can seem a very short school day. Added to this, in a normal year, we have the statutory tests, and this in itself often requires a juggling act between ensuring pupils are well prepared and engaging them in exciting and meaningful activities. Sufficient evidence needs to be gathered for teacher assessment of writing. Assessment judgments need to be made. And if you are due for an external moderation visit, this can result in additional pressure. It's also important to consider pupils' own imminent transition and to ensure that they are year seven ready and that they are confident and independent learners as they leave your school. Ashley, could we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So yes, the challenge is for the year six teacher, but this year we know has been a particularly challenging year. So pupils have lost valuable learning time, not over just one but over two academic years and there are bound to be gaps in their learning that need to be identified and addressed and they've also lost out on all of that social interaction that school provides and we know how hard teachers have been working to rebuild their confidence and their motivation and feedback has been really positive we've had reports from schools telling us that children have settled in really quickly, really well, and teachers are so pleased to have real children back in front of them rather than a frozen image on a screen. And of course, 
as teachers you've had to teach you've had to learn how to teach online you've had to cope with juggling remote learning with face-to-face -face learning with some pupils in school and many at home and then as margaret said this is the second year running now that we've had the cancellation of the national tests and teacher assessment so for you that means there's been a break in continuity in the way you make and moderate your teacher assessment judgments including those those very helpful professional discussions that take place during external moderation it has been interesting though to hear from the naht about the way schools are using assessment this summer to inform teaching and learning to report to parents and to support transition, particularly that year six into year seven secondary transition. And where arrangements are already in place, we know that some schools are moderating their assessment judgments with other schools, for example, in federations or in clusters. But of course, they're doing all of this without those additional layers of support that are typically in place. And can we have the next slide, please? Thanks, Ashley. So um, as Frances mentioned in her introduction, Jo and I have both been senior moderators. And as a result of this, we've been party to much debate and discussion about pupils' writing. Uh, we've been involved in, in many conversations with teachers and local authority moderators who, who've highlighted to us that there was a real need for new materials that would support teacher assessment. So we knew that we were well placed to produce a resource that would offer a high level of guidance and would also support teachers in making their assessment judgments. And we wanted to, to um, think about uh, a resource that would prove useful for continuing professional development uh, and for obviously internal moderation. But we didn't want to focus on assessment in isolation um, because we believe it should never be the tail that wags the dog. And I'm sure all of you appreciate how important it is for any form of assessment and to be part of a cyclical process. It should follow on from teaching and learning and in turn, it should be used to inform the learner's next steps. We know that when pupils know what their next steps are, and when they are really motivated to learn, they are far more likely to achieve better outcomes. So we set out to route the assessment materials within a range of high quality and teaching and learning opportunities that would offer a really joined up approach from reading into writing and finally into assessment guidance, which we wanted to make both summative and formative so that pupils would be able to see what their next steps might be. We also wanted to work closely with schools and to include samples of writing from real pupils that would be produced in response to the teaching and learning activities from biting to writing. And this would enable us to show how an individual pupil's writing could contribute to a specified national standard. So gradually our, our ideas began to take shape and culminating in the comprehensive resource that we had originally envisaged, Bite Into Writing. The next slide, please, Ashley, thank you. So I just want to say a little bit about the power of a good book, because I think we all know how a good book can transport a reader to other worlds, capturing the imagination and sparking or igniting ideas. And we also know, don't we, how a good book can foster empathy and understanding, enabling readers to, to enter other worlds and other lives 
to step into a character's shoes and experience the world from their perspective. But as well as those things, it can also build linguistic repertoire. You know, we know, don't we, that good readers are so often good writers. That sense of reading with a writer's eye. We can understand then how to write with a reader's eye, to write with our reader in mind, with that clear understanding of purpose and audience. So Margaret and I believe very firmly that quality writing emerges from quality reading, although of course we know it's not as simple as that. So that meant that very early on, we decided that the teaching and learning opportunities in this new resource would stem from the reading of quality texts. So each bite into writing book has at its core a quality published text that will inspire meaningful and quality writing. And as well as that, we offer suggestions for wider reading in the form of thematically linked texts so that pupils can make connections between the books they read. You'd probably like to know that the quality published text we chose for book one is Olive's Army. It's a short story from the collection When We Were Warriors by Emma Carroll. It's a fabulous story set during the Second World War and featuring a group of very resourceful children. And you may well have read its prequel, Letters from the Lighthouse. And in terms of book two, which is currently in production, we've chosen a non-fiction text called Everest, the remarkable story of Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. It really is a wonderful non-fiction text. It's beautifully illustrated and contains a diverse range of different text types and presentational features. So, in the next few slides, we are going to focus more on the teaching and learning side of Bite into Writing and let's capture our approach to this. So, the first part of the loop, as it were, the sort of read, write, assess loop, um, is rooted in reading. And we call this Talk and Explore. And it links to various aspects of the quality published text. So in these pages, you will find an extensive range of activities. And they are aimed at securing a deeper understanding of that source stimulus. You can see some examples of these on the right hand side of your screen. As well as stimulating discussion and debate, we wanted to give teachers opportunities for pupils to engage in drama, uh, for pupils to do their own independent research, and to work perhaps um, in exploring the writer's use of language. As teachers, you might choose to use these activities in different ways. Uh, for example, a guided group where pupils can uh, be supported in developing their skills of reading comprehension, or perhaps pairing pupils to develop a dialogue between, say, two characters in the story. One of the trial schools fed back that giving pupils some of the talk and explore materials in advance of their guided learning, their guided reading session, was particularly successful in focusing them on the writer's use of figurative language, which was one of the, the skills that they wanted their pupils to, to develop at that particular stage. So, uh, next slide please. Following on from reading, again, thinking about that loop from reading to writing, um, we have what we've called the write bites. And these invite pupils to capture their ideas through short burst writing opportunities for incidental writing. Uh, and this can very much act as preparation for those more extended pieces of writing, which will probably come later on. 
And again, you can see some examples of these on the right hand side of the screen. And they might include speech and thought bubbles, brief descriptions, comparisons, snippets of dialogue, postcards, notes. And often the right bites themselves link directly to one of the talk and explore activities. So an example of this might be um, offering opportunities to experiment with aspects of language to describe a setting or perhaps writing a short dialogue stemming from the role play of a conversation. Some write bites also incorporate activities from other areas of the curriculum. For example, through a suggested designing and making activity that links, say, to an advertisement or a set of instructions. And throughout the teaching and learning activities, you'll find uh, a number of our top tips. And as you can see on the screen, um, we have the little blue uh, elongated strip down the left hand side and, and a small icon, a, a small light bulb icon. And they, the, these top tips contrast with the activities as they, as the activities which um, address the reader directly um, the top tips really are for teachers and they offer additional ideas and suggestions as to perhaps how an activity can be broadened out. So perhaps to extend learning, to connect an activity to another area of the curriculum, or perhaps to suggest a way of introducing or enhancing a talk and explore, a talk and explore or a right by activity. Yes, and I'd just like to return to a point I made earlier when we said that that good readers are often good writers, but we do know that this transfer of knowledge doesn't always happen automatically. And Margaret's already mentioned the way that some of the teaching and learning activities, particularly the right bites, do draw quite specific and explicit attention to the language of the quality text and often invite pupils to draw on those features in their own writing. But we wanted to go further, we wanted to go much further, so each bite into writing book has two spotlight texts. We call them spotlight texts because they're shining a spotlight on the text and on the language. And these are short texts that we've written as models for other text types. And they complement the quality published text. And you can see an example here on the right hand side, Colonel Bagatelli's report. So this is a formal report based on an incident in the story Olive's Army and written from the point of view in role as one of the characters, Colonel Bagatelli. And these spotlight texts are short enough, typically one or at the most two sides of A4, to be shared in class on a visualizer perhaps, or on an interactive whiteboard, and then annotated with the class or perhaps shared with a small guided reading or guided writing group. And they can be used explicitly to support that reading into writing process by drawing out specific features of the text as a reader and then demonstrating perhaps or modeling the writing of a similar text with your class if we can just move on thank you and to support that whole process each spotlight text has a set of teaching prompts and the teaching prompts drill down into aspects of language that a writer chooses to adapt their writing for the audience and purpose. So, for example, text organisation and structure, choices of vocabulary, grammatical structures, use of punctuation, and of course, the way the writer's voice is presented. 
And these teaching prompts are intended to support teachers, to support teachers' subject knowledge. But we did want to make sure that they can be used flexibly. So we decided not to annotate the spotlight text themselves, but to provide the teaching prompt separately as a set of tools, if you like, so that teachers can focus if they have a particularly a, a particular teaching priority. For example, if their children really need to work on cohesion or a particular grammatical feature, like the use of the passive, then they can use those teaching prompts very flexibly to address that need. And you can see there on the right hand side, these are, this is just an extract from some of the teaching prompts that accompany the spotlight text you saw earlier. Um, you can see that where a key point is made, for example, about cohesion or vocabulary, that point is followed by examples from the text. And we've deliberately avoided a feature spotting approach so that everything we say is linked to the writer's choices in adapting the writing for its audience and purpose. And of course, the choices that will then impact on the reader. So we keep coming back to reading as a writer, writing as a reader. And um, yeah, just to just to kind of go back slightly and think about what we were saying earlier about the right bites and how they might support pupils in um, doing more extended pieces. Um, at the end of the teaching and learning materials, you will find there are uh, there is a range of opportunities for pupils to engage in more extended writing. Though, of course, these these might be introduced at the end of a chunk of text um, rather than once the whole text has been explored, because it's quite possible that, that you might read uh, two, three, four chapters and think, well, actually, one of those extended writing opportunities would fit really well here. Uh, the pupils are very engaged with <clears throat> what they've been reading. Um, they're, they've undergone a, a, a number of the right by opportunities and, and they're sort of, if, if you like, ready to then use that incidental right, that inter incidental writing <clears throat> to feed into a, a more extended piece. So the showcase prompts aim to offer pupils choice in what they write about. Uh, chosen tasks might appeal to individual pupils' strengths or interests, or perhaps help to balance their collection of writing, uh, say, for example, in terms of fiction or non-fiction pieces. And also, there is no doubt that reluctant writers become more engaged when a task really captures their imagination. Uh, there are many examples of showcase writing prompts, and, and so some of these you can see on the right hand side of your screen. Um, others perhaps include um, prompts that are linked to the spotlight text or the thematically linked texts, uh, which, which are listed um, at the beginning of the book. So an example of this might be um, inviting pupils to explore and compare the way children are presented in wartime um, in the uh, published text Olive's Army with, say, uh, those in one of the linked texts, Goodnight Mr Tom, for example, or Carrie's War. It's really important to note that the showcase prompts are designed to elicit a uh, an extensive range of quality writing aimed at different purposes and audiences and also with different levels of formality. Uh, and you'll know yourselves that this is quite critical in terms of that end of year moderation when you want to see that pupils can apply themselves and write effectively for different purposes and audiences. OK, so just just moving on, then we've we've talked quite rightly, I think, at length about the teaching and learning activities. But let's remember that the impetus for Bite into Writing did come from the need to support teacher assessment of writing. 
So for that reason, each book contains sets of writing exemplars. And these have been produced by the year six pupils who tried out the teaching activities for us. In book one, there are three sets of exemplars, each set containing three or four pieces of writing from the same pupil. And you can just see from the example here on the right hand side that we typically start off by including um, a piece in the pupil's own handwriting and then the rest is typically transcribed, but we do include any errors or any edits made by the pupil. And then you can see down the right hand side that each piece of writing is annotated and we annotate to show how the writing meets the pupil can statements in the teacher assessment framework. And we include examples there as well, just as we have in fact for the spotlight texts. Now you can't see this on the screen, but each set of exemplars also has an overall commentary. And that commentary provides an overview of the writing and offers supportive next steps for the pupil. And it explains how the writing contributes to a particular standard and also why it doesn't yet meet the next standard. So in that way, the exemplars can be used both formatively and summatively. Um, so you can see on the right hand side of the screen um, what we've called the showcase writing record and this this is really a writing record for year six pupils to take um, some ownership of and um, also to take responsibility for building a, a balanced collection of writing uh, to ensure that they've written for a range of purposes and audiences and with different levels of formality and you might just be able to see there that we have a a, a level of formality continuum uh, set of boxes so that pupils can think about uh, the formality that's required in a, a, a piece of um, writing and, and tick the box that they think is most appropriate. So um, it also, of course, would provide a very useful tool for moderation um, because it will enable teachers to quickly access specific pieces of work in a pupil's book, uh, just referring to the date, the, the, the type of writing that the pupil uh, has, has done and um, it will enable teachers within that moderation session to, to demonstrate that the pupil has actually um, written for a range of purposes and audiences, but, al but also the teacher will be able to know, find where um, the different pupil can statements have actually been met. So I think it pretty much speaks for itself. OK, so we just wanted to conclude really with with what we see as some of the main benefits of Bite into Writing. And remember, we started off, didn't we, by saying what a very challenging year this has been. So one of our priorities was to make sure that Bite into Writing would save teachers time. And we believe that the time saving implications are enormous. So, for example, the talk and explore and write bite activities that Margaret's been talking about are broadly organised into lesson size chunks, but they're not lesson plans because we wanted to build in flexibility. We wanted to avoid that highly prescriptive approach and, you know, reflecting on the year that we've had, I think that's perhaps more important than ever this year. And the materials can be used in a range of ways. They can be used with a whole class. They can be used with a small guided reading or guided writing group, or they can be used as remote learning, which we've just seen during the recent lockdown where they've been used very successfully. And of course, there's a wealth of activities in each book, which saves on planning time. And those activities include links to aspects, other aspects of the curriculum, for example, in history, geography, science, art and design, PSHE, and more. 
and they're all based around a quality published text which is supporting reading comprehension as well as writing. And we talked earlier, didn't we, about the potential impact this year on pupil confidence and motivation. So we've really focused on promoting pupil independence. And we've, we've done that in a number of ways. We've deliberately provided a very wide choice of activities for pupils. And in little things like addressing pupils directly in the materials, apart from the top tips which address the teachers, the, the materials address the pupils directly. And we've included research or find out about activities. And as Margaret's just, just mentioned, we do encourage pupils to take ownership of their, their writing record, their writing showcase record. And we wanted to, to help them to keep track of that balanced range of writing they're producing for different purposes and audiences. And as Margaret said, for different levels of formality with that very helpful continuum that's on the writing record that really prompts them to think about that. And then, of course, that final point, the guidance for making teacher assessment judgments, which, of course, as you know, was our starting point for all of this. And I think there's just one more slide. Thank you. We've we've had some really positive feedback on the material so far with one, the first book, book one now published and the second one on its way. So you can see here some feedback um, from a teacher in one of the trial schools who talked about how nice it was to have a non-fiction text as a stimulus in this particular trial and feedback from other colleagues as well. Uh, an independent consultant there, the first one, and Pi Corbett at the bottom there, who will be known to many of you, who talks about great material for linking quality reading into writing, etc. Well, thank you very much, Jo and Margaret, for that interesting and informative presentation. In a moment, we're going to move on to some questions. But first of all, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how you can find out more about Bite Into Writing if you'd like to. So the easiest way is just to Google Bite Into Writing. And from there, you'll be taken to the NFVR website where you can learn more and or place an order if you'd like to. Book one is available now. Book two will be ready during April. And book three can also be pre-ordered at that time. And book three will be ready for delivery in August. And finally, we welcome your interest in becoming involved. So if you'd like to join our panel of schools who test materials, please do send us an email at nferclassroom at nfer.ac.uk. Okay, as I mentioned a little earlier, we now have a few moments for some questions. So I've got one here, which is about quality texts. The question says, I think the discussion on the power of quality texts is really interesting. So Jo and Margaret, do you have any views on which is better for inspiring children to write, fiction or non-fiction? OK, I'll, I'll, I'll take that question, Francis. Thank you. It's an interesting one. I think as a teacher, I probably tended to draw mainly on fiction, but I think there's a far, far greater balance now of fiction and non-fiction used in schools. We were delighted with the success of Everest, which was our non-fiction published text for book two. Um, it really did inspire pupils in the trial schools to write and in fact one one pupil told her teacher that she thought it had helped her to produce her best writing ever um i think i'd say they're probably fiction and non-fiction probably of equal merit in terms of the way they can inspire writing and uh, you know of course you could you could write you could write a non-fiction piece in response to um a fiction text couldn't you or a fiction piece in response to non-fiction but 
I think it is more than inspiring writing. I think if, as we've said before, if we really want to help children to adapt their writing for different purposes and audiences, then they need to be exposed to those text types. So, you know, if, if, if you want, if you want your pupils to write a persuasive leaflet, they need to see some good examples of persuasive leaflets and they need to have those features mm -hmm. teased out um, so that they can experiment with the structure and the language um, that, that's typical of them. And, and of course, that's that's the purpose of the spotlight text, as we've already discussed. Does that does that go some way to to answering? I, th I think it does. Thank you very much, Joe. I think there's plenty of food for thought there um, for exploration. So we're going to move on now to a question about developing talk, which is very interesting. So the question is, does the bite into writing approach incorporate elements to specifically develop talk within the writing process? Um, so I'll pick up on this one, I think, Francis. Um, Thanks, Margaret. So, well, the answer is absolutely, of course. Um, and and one of the things we wanted to do was to ensure that um, talk was a thread that ran through all of our books. Um, and it's interesting because Joe touched on earlier about you know good readers being good writers, and but but not always the case. And actually, talk is as influential, I think, in 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 supporting pupils to become a good writer um, as as reading is. So it's obviously an essential vehicle for responding to the talk and explore activities within each book, but it is more than just simply discussion. For example, um, one of the things it can really help with is um, developing a writer's voice. And we have many activities within each book to encourage this. Uh, and, uh, and as an example of this, um, I, uh, perhaps the use of oral behaviour, sorry, oral <laughs> rehearsal in drama and in role play, or, or say the improvisation of, of a conversation. And then, in, again, this, this connection from reading into writing, from talking to writing, connects to the right bites. Uh, for instance, through transposition to speech and thought bubbles, or snippets of dialogue, which in turn helps to establish a greater sense of that purpose and audience. And, and talk is also key in helping pupils to internalise the structures of language. Uh, and this is a key feature, as, as Joe touched on before, uh, of the spotlight text. Um, pupils might use the spotlight text to in, in explore the tone and formality required of the writing or perhaps how the writer expresses their opinions or how they've perhaps taken a, a particular stance about something. So the spotlight text aim to support imitation and innovation through the exploration of language uh, and this in itself links back to the developing a strong writer's voice and I think hopefully that sort of shows how we have talk as a thread through the whole of each by into writing book. Thank you Margaret Thank you. that's incredibly helpful and I think we can see there plenty of connections there between the talk and the writing. So we're going to just move on to a question now um, about the use of the materials in mixed ability classes. So the question is, would bite into writing be appropriate for a mixed ability class or even a mixed year five, year six class? Um, to pick up on this one, I think because um, I have actually taught in a mixed uh, year five six class in the past um so perhaps i can speak partly from experience so um the first set of bite into writing books has obviously been primarily written for year six but i i know that they would work really well in a mixed age class and in fact one of the teachers who tried out the materials for book two used them really successfully with a year five six class 
uh, and commented on how the activities had inspired all of the pupils' writing, and actually, even though much of it was undertaken remotely. So, um, as we touched on in the slides, each book offers a, a really flexible, non-prescriptive approach, and that in itself enables teachers to guide pupils towards activities that, that support a developmental stage in their learning. So, for example, a pupil working towards the expected standard might be steered towards a writing task that lends itself, say, to using a range of devices to build cohesion. Whilst perhaps a pupil on the brink of greater depth might select a task which would enable them to evidence conscious control over the required level of formality. And some of the writing opportunities, though they may appear similar, they, they offer different levels of challenge. So perhaps to stretch the more able or to encourage those who may lack confidence in their own ability uh, when faced with a large blank piece of paper. So, I, so yeah, definitely. Mm, thank you very much, Margaret. And I think we can see from there, there's plenty of um, scope there for usage. So just to finish off, there's one question here about the use of the spotlight texts. Um, Margaret and Joe, could you say just a little bit more, please, about the use of those spotlight texts? So we're thinking of what different possibilities might there be for them, for example, using them for CPD purposes. Yeah, I can I can come in there, Francis, if that's, Thank you, Joe. that's helpful. So mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the spotlight texts, um, let's link them to the teaching prompts that accompany each spotlight text because they are there to support teacher subject knowledge. And I think we already said that we've designed them very flexibly so that they can be used in a range of ways. So in terms of CPD, um, for example, you could, oh, I think you should be thinking about how you'd use them to uh, inform your teaching. So let's think about maybe you have a particular teaching priority, you know, your class, I think we said earlier, um, may be struggling with something like cohesion or whole text structure and organization or the use of punctuation or a particular type of punctuation. You could focus on um, that particular aspect of language um, in a very flexible but, but explicit way. Um, if the issue is cohesion, as we've said, you could be teasing out in those spotlight texts here, what, what is it that makes these texts cohesive? And the teaching prompts will, will support that. Um, and then, of course, with your children, you can be thinking about, well, how can we import some of these cohesive devices into our own writing, into other pieces of writing? So that's one way. Um, are we, uh, as teachers, looking for some specific support in terms of our subject knowledge with maybe some of the grammar of, of text, such as the passive or even expanded noun phrases? And it's so important then, isn't it, to think about how they, how they work in the context of a real text, like a newspaper report. You know, if you think about newspaper headlines, um, those short passives that you so typically find in a newspaper headline or the, the abundance of noun phrases which can create a kind of a weightiness and density with such economy where you know, have a limited number of words in column length. And that sort of application of grammar is so much better, isn't it, than, than using decontextualised exercises. Um, and I suppose another way, a third way, finally, might be to think about how they're really going to support your classroom practice. I know one teacher in one of the trial schools used the teaching prompts to help her to annotate the spotlight texts with her class to tease out some of the features that she wanted to explore. So they just provided that, that extra support for her. Or they could help you um, to model, to demonstrate writing of uh, a piece of text with your class to support that whole process of articulating your choices and thinking aloud as you demonstrate the writing. So 
oh, I think the possibilities are endless, really. Well, thank you very much, Joe. I think it's really useful to have those additional insights into the possibilities and use of the spotlight tag. So thank you both of you for all of those responses and considerations about those um, questions. Well, our time now is drawing to a close. Um, however, if you have a question about Bite into Writing that hasn't been covered by the presentation or that uh, short question session that we've just had, please do email the team at NFER Classroom and we'll be more than happy to help you with your query. So it just remains for me now to thank Jo and Margaret very much indeed for their time today and also to you for joining us here at the NFER and attending and participating in this webinar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.